Good evening and welcome to another Northshire Presents event. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rachel Person. I'm the event manager for Northshire Bookstore with locations in Saratoga Springs, New York and Manchester Center, Vermont. Before we get started, a couple of quick notes. First of all, thank you for your incredible loyalty and support of indie bookstores and of Northshire. Um, it's been a tough couple of years and our stores still exist thanks to the loyalty and support of customers like you. So thank you so much for being here tonight and for shopping with us. Um, a quick logistical note, um, you will find at the bottom of your screen a Q&A box. Um, you can use that to type in any questions that you have throughout the evening. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the event. So type in your questions at any time and we will save those up and uh, pose them for you a little bit later on this evening. Those are the boring logistical notes. Um, now I'm so pleased to introduce our guest this evening. Charlie Lovett is, a pro is the prolific New York Times bestselling author of novels for adults and children, as well as the author of many nonfiction works on Lewis Carroll. His plays for children have been seen in over 5,000 productions worldwide, and he hosts the podcast Inside the Writer's Studio. He's with us tonight to talk about two of his recent books, the novel The Enigma Affair and his book Lewis Carroll, Formed by Faith. He's in conversation tonight with Kate Forsyth, whose books include Bitter Greens, a retelling of Rapunzel, which won the 2015 American Library Association Award for Best Historical Fiction, The Wild Girl, and The Beast's Garden. Recently voted one of Australia's favorite 15 novelists, she has been called one of the finest writers of this generation. Her most recent book is The Crimson Thread, and I'll be putting links to all of those books I mentioned in the chat in just a moment. Charlie and Kate, thank you so much for being here. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, and thank you to everyone for joining us. The, the miracle of technology means that I'm ringing in from Perth, Australia. It's 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning here. So um, I'm very, very glad to be able to join you and to have a chance to talk to Charlie, whose wonderful book, The Enigma Affair, I read on the plane yesterday. So thank you so much, Charlie. I'd really like to start um, to, you know, talking about the Enigma Affair. And if you could perhaps tell me your very first inspirations for this book, and perhaps for those out there who haven't had the privilege of reading it yet, maybe just give us a very short soundbite precis of it. Sure. I think, you know, it's funny, I, thinking about talking about this book, I feel like it's the first book I've ever written where I I had the tagline before I finished writing the book. <laughs> Usually you write a book and your publicist says, sum it up in a sentence and you you can't do it um but in this case i um i as i was working on the book i i sort of came up with the idea that this is a book about uh a small town librarian and a professional assassin who team up to solve a 75 year old nazi mystery um and the background of the book is the fact that they, they come across a, an encoded message from world war ii that they believe if they decode, will still have relevance today. I don't want to. I don't want to give too much away. And so, mm -hmm. there's a lot of background um, that has to do with the breaking of the Enigma Code at, at Bletchley Park. And I first became interested in that because I I got to know, uh, become friends with a woman named Mavis Beatty, who shared my interest in Lewis Carroll, and we we became mm -hmm. close friends. And I I later in her life, I discovered that she had been at Bletchley, but I didn't know much about what she had done there. And it wasn't until really till after her death that I discovered. That she was one of the very key people at Bletchley involved in the in the breaking of the Enigma Code, uh, and I knew another uh, woman who was one of the people who worked on the equipment that they used to break the code with, and was one of the people who maintained these these essentially very very early computers. And so it was knowing them and discovering the incredibly heroic work that they had done during the war um, that kind of inspired me to go down that path to want to do something mm -hmm. with Enigma. And when we were visiting Bletchley one time, one of the docents said, uh, you know, we have thousands of undecrypted Enigma messages in our archives. And if you say that to a tourist, a tourist will go, isn't that interesting? But if you say it to a novelist, a novelist gets, you know, wide eyes and goes, that's a great idea. I could use <laughs> one of those. And so that's kind of where the book started was with this idea that, you know, what if there was an undecrypted Enigma message in 2015 that uh, two incredibly different protagonists got thrown together and felt like for, for some reason or other they needed to decrypt it and where, where might it lead them and that, that was my, my starting point. And it's a fantastic premise for the book and I've, I've got to apologize the hotel room that I'm in 
if you don't move, the light turns off. And I only just discovered that. So please forgive me. I'm just going to be waving my hands around madly for the next half hour just to keep my lights on. <laughs> and it's pitch black here because it's it's so early in the morning, so yeah, there's no yeah. light from outside. So please forgive me. Um, it's such a fantastic premise for a, a novel, and you must have had that electric thrill as soon as the idea came to you that, you know, we novelists love it when an idea comes to us out of the blue. You know, we, I think, are fascinated by secret codes. Um, I know when I was uh, a little girl, we had a book called How to Be a Spy. And, you know, my sister and I, it was only like a, a little kiddies book, but it was full of things like secret codes and disguises and, and you know, how to shadow someone. And my sister and I, just devoured it and used to practice on each other, pretending that we were spies. <laughs> Why do you think that we're so fascinated by this shadowy aspect of human life? Well, I mean, I think we're fascinated by secrets because, you know, we, there, I mean, there's two aspects to, to the secret, right? There's the person who knows the secret and there's the person that you're keeping it the secret, the secret from. And we all want to be the person who knows the secret. We don't want to be the one who it's, who it's being kept from. So if you are, if, if you're the reader, if you're reading a novel, often that means you you get to know the secret. You, you get to be the one who has the information. Um, and so I think I think there's that's part of it. Um, I think also that there's been so much lately where we've started to discover the more hidden aspects, in particular of World War II. But you know, the some of the Things that have to do with espionage, with code breaking, with with spying, these things tend to be kept secret for a very long time. Uh, you know, the mm. British government made people sign something called the Official Secrets Act, which said they couldn't talk about the code breaking work at Bletchley Park, for instance, for 50 years after the war. Now, it did come out in the mid 1970s, but for you know a good 25 years after the war or more, um, it, it remained a secret. And so, as we're starting to find out about some of these hidden parts of of our history um i think there's a fascination about them because we you know we thought we knew how world war ii went down and we thought we knew how the allies managed to emerge victorious because we went to school and we read about all the battles and the generals and so we must know everything and now it turns out there was this whole other war that we didn't know about that was maybe even more key in establishing the Allied victory than than the war that that we got taught about in school. And so I think all of that just uh, the combination of all those things just um, makes for very rich ground for for writers of, of both fiction and nonfiction. I mean, you know, a good book is one that is built on secrets. What you know, what we do as novelists is that we sit, we, we set up the readers' expectations, <clears throat> so they think they know what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. But then we have a few, you know, secrets up our sleeve. And, you know, that is the secret, you know, that's how we build suspense. So I don't want to talk too much about the many secrets that you've built into your narrative because it's a spoiler and half the fun of reading a book is having your expectations confounded. But I would like to know a, um, a little bit about how you plan your novels, how carefully, because mm -hmm. to... To be able to have you know all those conjurer's tricks and to bring them out at exactly the right time, how much do you uh, you know construct those ideas in advance, or are you doing it on a wish and a prayer? Well, so a little bit of each. I will say, you know, typically for most of my novels, I I have an idea of where I'm going, but I don't necessarily know <clears throat> how I'm going to get there. With this novel, I'd never really tried to write um, a thriller before. I mean, I, to me, I, I feel of this, I think of this novel as a thriller. I mean, the main character is in mortal peril, literally in the first sentence. Uh, and it's just kind of a, you know, a thrill ride from there on. And I did find myself sort of doing a little bit more planning and layout and not quite outlining, but sort of in certain sections outlining, sort of starting to think about where the the set pieces of action might fall. Um, when, I, when I look back on this, this book and think, well, how did I learn how to write a thriller? If I, if I do know, how, who, who taught me? You know, And I certainly read, I've read Ken Follett and Frederick Forsyth and Tom Clancy and, and um, 
but I think really the person who taught me about thrillers was Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, mm. And one of the things you see in a Hitchcock film is you have these set pieces of action um, that alternate with sort of quieter moments, you know, and those set pieces, those action pieces, as you get closer to the end of the film, they get closer and closer together so that you're building yeah. pace as you go. And so I think I, I sort of understood what a lot of the set pieces were gonna be, um, but I didn't necessarily have everything planned out in between. But there were certainly points where I would get to a point in the, in the writing and go, oh, if I did this, that would really surprise everybody. And then you have to go back and make sure <laughs> that you have set it up right. You know, that, and so you do, you do end up, I always end up editing more the first half of the book than the second half of the book because you come up with ideas and you have to go, okay, now I've got to go back and I've got to drop the little hints so that when this unexpected thing happens, the reader can look back and go, oh, how did I not see that coming? He, he <laughs> dropped the hints, but I, I missed it. You know, And you, you want to drop just enough hints so that the reader will have that reaction, but not so many hints that the reader will figure out you know, that it's coming. And, that, and I think that's part of the bargain that readers expect with a thriller. They want to have that sudden re reversal of fortune that they, did, they didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they want to be fooled by us and, and they, they want to try to guess and they want to guess wrong and then have a surprise. That's, I that's absolutely, yeah. absolutely yeah. agree. I think it's part of the pleasure of, of reading a book like this to see how cleverly constructed it is and to see the way that you've been um, led in one direction unsuspectingly when, you know, when if you've been more alert, you might have noticed. I love the fact that you mentioned the key to Rebecca in yeah. your book, which is one of Ken Follett's most famous thrillers. Um, I actually reread that book while I was writing The Crimson Thread because oh, it's, um, you know, like it is, it is based on a true famous story of an undercover German spy in Cairo um, and, and Egypt. And um, quite a bit of my book is set in that underworld, that, sh that shadowy underworld of the SOE in Egypt. Um, and also he was just such a brilliant, um, his characters are so vivid and alive. Um, I loved your characters in your book as well. Um, it was such a, a, a brilliant idea to have this idea of the librarian and the, and the assassin, these two very different people who find that they have more in common than they would expect, mm -hmm. racing against time to solve this mystery. How do you build your characters? You know, I think for those two characters, I did sort of work on them ahead of time. I, I'll tend to start to think about the main characters um, before I start writing and I will, you know, I'll just sort of start to, start to imagine their backgrounds where, you know, maybe what, what's, I don't know their whole backstory, but a little bit about the backstory. Um, and especially with Nemo, the assassin, I thought, you know, how, this is a guy who lives sort of off the grid in the shadows. How does he do that? How would I do that? And so you try to sort of imagine those things and how would that affect you as a character? So that by the time I start, I've maybe written some a page or two or three pages of sort of character sketch for each of these characters that I've that might have sort of a brief history of their background and what they look like and you know some things about their personality. I don't get to know them really, really well until I start to see them, you know, do things, interact with one another. Um, mm. But the other the other side of the coin on this book is then the minor characters, some of whom are are not that minor. I mean, there's a whole sort of team that they end up with in, in the end. <laughs> and um, in, in that case, what I discovered is writing a thriller, a lot of those characters grew out of what I think Liam Neeson called uh, the need for a very particular set of skills. You know, as, as you're going along, I, I went, oh, wait a minute, I need I need an art historian. <laughs> okay, well, there was that character back at the beginning who I just said was, you know, university professor. There's no reason in the world why she couldn't be an art historian and then I can bring her along and I can develop her and make her more. And, uh, oh, I need somebody who, who collects Nazi artifacts. Okay, well, what kind of person would that be? You know, and so, so many of the other characters besides, besides Patton, the, the librarian, and Nemo, the assassin, um, grew out of the needs of the plot. And then that's, the the kind of needs that I had started to define what kind of character they were going to be. And then mm -hmm. again, once you sort of 
put them all out there with each other and have them interact with each other and see how they react to stressful situations and everything else, then, then they start to sort of come alive as, as three-dimensional characters. Absolutely, absolutely love it. Um, so one of the characters um, who I think you must have had um, great enjoyment bringing to life on the page was um, Heinrich Himmler, mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the most famous and most psychologically fascinating of Hitler's um, closest cohorts. Um, and what I'd like to ask you about is um, what it's like to have to deal with such a villainous villain and you know why you think it's so important that books have these um these monstrous characters in it yeah i i think you know the villain is something i see this very often in in thrillers and in mysteries and other sorts of books where there, where there is a villain that while the protagonists often occupy a moral gray area and that's certainly true of this book you could you could have a long debate about some of the things that Nemo and, and Patton for that matter do um, and whether the ends justify the means but that the villains tend to not occupy a moral gray area the villains tend to be and, I, and I've noticed this in several thrillers that I've read lately they tend to be pretty despicable people and, and no, there's no real sympathy between the, the reader and the villain. Now, I'm sure there, there are plenty of books where that's not the case, but, in, but a lot of times in a straight thriller, that's the way it works. So if you want to have a villain that where you've got the, where, you, where that's built in, where you automatically, you don't have to say anything, you just know the reader is going to have no sympathy for this person, you know, pick Heinrich Himmler pick Hermann Goring, pick Adolf Hitler, you know, that you just have to say those names and immediately the reader is like, oh, that's a that's a villainous, horrible person. And you, you almost don't have to do anything else. Um, so it, so in a way, it becomes almost a shorthand and it, and it allows me to get straight to the action of what he's doing uh, without having to establish that you're not supposed to like him and that he's he's, you know, morally reprehensible. Um, on the flip side of, of that is the, the modern day villain who is sort of walking in Himmler's footsteps, but who is much more cagey about it. And at the, at the beginning of the book, at least we think that this might be a good person. Uh, and I thought that would be sort of interesting to see how does someone who is trying to follow in the steps of, of someone who committed genocide, uh, try to to present themselves as you know a decent member of society in order mm. to get away with things um so you kind of i kind of got to do it both ways from the the pre-existing villain in in the world war ii time period to this this modern day villain who while she shares a lot of qualities uh is is i, I don't, I don't want to say more complex but is more of a of a mystery to the reader especially at the beginning uh as to is exactly what she's up to Absolutely. So I'm. This is something that I'm. I'm particularly interested in. Um, and in you know my novel, The Crimson Thread, which is set in World War II during Crete. Um, part of of my book is I've I've woven through like the shadow story of the Minotaur in in the labyrinth, which is yeah. an ancient yeah. Cretan myth. And to me, you know, the Minotaur is a classic kind of mythic monster. And I think that, um, you know, one of the reasons why it's so important to have um, these, these monstrous characters in fiction is it's a place where the reader can actually project into these, these dark figures, you know, their own shadow selves, you know, their fears, their desires, their, you know, um, it, it's good for us to have a narrative function in the story, a place for us to act out these things that frighten us. And I think that's one of the clear functions of thrillers um, is they keep us on the edge of our seat where we're fully engaged. But at the end of the book, we we actually have had this, this cathartic experience of looking evil in the face and surviving. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. I think there's something else too is that when you're reading a book, when you're when you're in a sequence and you're seeing it from somebody's point of view, we have a tendency to um, 
sympathize with the person whose point of view we're seeing it from. So mm -hmm. if you have a sequence where you're seeing things from the point of view of the villain, even though in the overall world of the book, the reader opposes the villain, in that moment, the reader's kind of going, hey, I wonder if she's going to get away with it. Oh, that's a clever thing she did. Ooh, look at her. Oh. You, know, you almost can't help it. And it's, it's, it's kind of fun to manipulate the reader that way. So you sort of pull them back and forth between being in the world of the villain and being in the world of the heroes. And since, you know, they, they, at the beginning, they don't know how those two worlds are going to collide. They don't know how the, that collision is going to play out and they don't know who is ultimately going to win. Um, but you, you can kind of play this game with the reader where you're like, okay, for the next 15 pages, we're, we're on the villain's side. And you know, the, the villain never thinks they're the villain. The villain is, as I think Scott Turo said the other day in, in a panel that I had him on, um, he said, you know, every villain thinks that they're the hero of their own story. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so to, to have the reader be in that hero's story uh, for, for a few pages, um, not only does it sort of amp up the tension because they can sort of see, oh gosh, what are they up to? But it, but it pulls the reader back and forth between um, kind of whose side they're on, even though you know ultimately you want them to be on the hero's side. You know, it's, it's fun to have those moments where they're sort of seeing through the villain's eyes and Absolutely. getting excited about what the villain is accomplishing. You know. <laughs> so um, I'd like to leave the Enigma affair now to go to, um, so we just have so many connections between us, Charlie, more than I think you realize, apart from the fact that we're both fascinated by World War II and by secret codes and by heroes and villains and spies in the shadowy world. Um, we also share um, a love of antiquarian books. We're both collectors. And we're both fascinated by children's fiction. And unlike many writers, we write for both adults and children. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would like to um, talk to you now a little bit about Lewis Carroll, who it might seem like a complete jump, but it's not because Lewis Carroll was famously fascinated by uh, wordplay and secret hidden meanings and secret codes. And, um, I know many a Lewis Carroll um, obsessive reader who loves to decode his books. Can you talk a little bit to me about what began your fascination with the author of Alice in Wonderland? Sure. Um, I mean, to, to build briefly on what you just said, mm -hmm. Lewis Carroll himself actually invented a couple of different ciphers that he he published yeah. little cards, that the, one called the alphabet cipher and another one called the telegraph cipher. So yeah, he was fascinated by by mm -hmm. codes, he invented a way of of writing at night that essentially, where he created a whole alphabet that you know. Um, but my my fascination came as a child. I used to listen. We had these long playing records of the British actor Cyril, Cyril Richard reading Alice in Wonderland, and we I didn't never seen the book. I just had heard this this story as the Alice and her sisters originally heard it as a as an oral um, you know storytelling experience. Uh, but my father was a book collector, and so I got interested in book collecting. And as a young man, I thought maybe Alice in Wonderland might be an interesting thing to collect because I thought there's probably been mm -hmm. several different versions done, and maybe it's been translated, and maybe it's been illustrated by different people. I had no idea what I was getting into, mm -hmm. and I knew nothing about Lewis Carroll either at the time. Mm -hmm. He could have turned out to be, you know, a really boring fellow who wrote two good books. Um, as it turns out, he is was a fascinating sort of almost Renaissance man, a, a quintessential Victorian. Um, mm -hmm. brilliant photographer, a mathematician, logician, a great lover of the theater as I, as I am, uh, and, uh, you know, a lover of children, and, uh, and a man of very deep faith. Um, and I felt like all of those things that I listed up until that last thing had been written about ad infinitum by, by biographers over the period of, mm -hmm. of 100 and, almost 150 years, um, or sort of 125 years since the first biography. Um, but that his faith, which I believed underpinned all of those other things, had been given rather short shrift. Um, that it's certainly mentioned in biographies, and there'll, there'll be a sentence or two, or maybe in the, some of the larger books, even a whole chapter, um, but that it had never been gone into in very much depth. And I began to work on it, and eventually the, the, the book that came out of it is called Lewis Carroll Formed by Faith, and it is... Mm -hmm. 
it is a biography that really focuses on his religious upbringing, his religious beliefs, and the way his religion played out in his adult life and, and through his works, his photography, his relationship with children, his relationship with family, um, his mathematics, his logic, everything else. Um, and, and one of the wonderful things about taking such a different tack from what other biographers had done was I found myself looking at all this source material that had never been used in, in previous biographies. So it's a very different kind of biography, but it's also one in which I think even someone who's read a half a dozen biographies of Lewis Carroll will find much uh, that is new. And, and yeah. I hope it's interesting. It's certainly interesting to me. Oh, absolutely. I mean, he is a fascinating man. I find I'm so drawn to him as well. And I think when you are truly fascinated by a subject, you want to read everything on it. It doesn't matter if if there are other books out there on that subject. You're, you, you want, it's that collector's obsessive nature. So, um, I, and I, I have to ask you, I know that you spend half of every year in Kingham in the Cotswolds. Um, well, I, I actually run a writing retreat in the Cotswolds every single year. Um, and one of the reasons why I go to the Cotswolds every single year is, of course, because it has, it's such, has such a rich literary heritage. Apart from Lewis Carroll, who's one of the authors that we actually talk about and read about on my retreat, um, it is, of course, the home of the Inklings, C.S. Yeah. Lewis and J.R.R. R. Tolkien, who I I collect. Um, so I have beautiful first editions. And, you know, my, my dream would be to buy, because I love ephemera, my dream would be to buy a letter from Tolkien, yeah. you know, to Jack or vice versa. But um, I wanted to ask you, um, when are you planning to go to the Cotswolds again? Because maybe we should meet up and have a drink we at should, the Bird absolutely. Baby in Oxford. Yeah, and I need, do you know Brian Sibley? I mean, I need to introduce you to Brian if you don't know him already, but he's-, mm. he's I know he's of Tolkien. him. Yeah, he's a great Tolkien um, enthusiast. He, he's the one who adapted um, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings for BBC back radio back in the seventies, I think. But, uh, but anyhow, uh, we are typically there. You know, my, my publisher makes it sound like we spend half the year there. We, we usually spend about six weeks um, there. I think we'll be there in May next year. Is our, is our hope? Um, as it's I said, everything in life in is, is in pencil these days. But, but one of the reasons we ended up in the Cotswolds is because when we were going to go there to live for for a few months i wanted to be close to oxford because i wanted to be able to study lewis carroll and in fact on our last trip there i went to and took the train into oxford on at least five different occasions i think working at the bodleian working at the christchurch mm -hmm. library the christchurch archives um on on various different aspects of of carroll um because there's again there's so many things there that still haven't really been fully described, fully examined, fully uh, understood. Uh, there's, Isn't there's that just one of the done. most wonderful experiences? I've done that as well, being at the Bodleian, yeah, yeah. you know, going into the room, having to surrender any sharp <laughs> instruments, pens, you know, having some ancient book or, you know, letters or diaries brought up and laid out on the sandbags and you know, touching this piece of work that was once touched by a writer who you revere. Isn't it magical? It is. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. I, I had an experience a couple of years ago where I, while I was working on Lewis Carroll Foreign by Faith, I was writing about his, his preaching. And so I was sort of going into all of the sort of public addresses that he'd given, whether religious or not religious. I wanted to give a background on him as sort of a public speaker. And I discovered he'd given a couple of speeches to something called the Ashmolean Society. So I thought, well, I wonder if they have an archive. And they do. It's at the Bodleian. And I, I wonder if they keep copies of the speeches. Well, as I'm going through the archive, mostly no. It's mostly just minutes of the meetings. And then all of a sudden, here they are. These manuscripts in Lewis Carroll's handwriting of these two speeches that he'd given. And I don't think anybody knew they were there. And it was so hard not to just jump up on the table and dance with glee in this room where you're supposed to be very <laughs> quiet and stayed, you know. And so you just have to very quietly go, <laughs> you know. Well, I don't want to show my villainous side, but I would have been very tempted to slip them underneath my jacket and creep very quietly out you of know, the room. You know, you have to remember that oath that you've taken when you go in as a yep. bodily and reader and, and, and try to be a, a good person. But luckily I was allowed to photograph them. And so we, 
we have transcriptions and, you know, but it, yeah, it's, it's just a, a, an amazing thing to work in a place like that. I just think those moments, those moments of discovery are such a wonderful part of what it is that we do, Charlie. Our, you know, um, we know when someone reads a book, um, they see the, you know, the final finished perfect version but underneath it there is so much work so many challenges and so many moments of discovery now I would actually like um, to open up to questions now um, yeah. I'm I'm sure that our lovely audience would like a chance to ask you some questions of their own um, Charlie, um, Rachel I'm gonna throw it to you as we have some great questions that have come in and audience, if you want to ask any other questions, you can put them in the chat or into the Q&A box that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, the first one we have comes from Stephanie. Um, she asks, does your background in the theater influence how you see your books and develop your characters? So Stephanie has a head start on all the rest of you because she and I did theater together in college. So she knows that I have a background <laughs> in the theater. Uh, and, and yeah, we go way back. Um, you know, I think it does. I think it. I think being in the theater helped me understand about the structure of narratives, the structure of storytelling, the different ways you can tell stories. Um, I know that working as a children's playwright for so long, what you know, whenever you exercise one muscle group, then you get really good with that muscle group. You know, I'm a runner, so my legs are pretty strong. Um, probably they're stronger than my arms. As a writer of plays, I developed my dialogue writing muscle group. And so when I'm writing a novel now and I get into a scene that's dialogue, um, that's just a pretty easy scene for me because I'm, I've just, I just did nothing but write dialogue for about a decade, you know? Um, so I, I, think that, I think the answer is yes. I think, and I think also, especially when those, those set action pieces that we talked about, I tend to see those, uh, maybe not theatrically, maybe more cinematically, but I definitely think of them, I definitely sort of stand back and, and watch them in the way that I would watch something unfold on stage. Um, and I'm having the very interesting experience right now, for the last year or so, I've been involved working with a director and a group of actors, um, adapting one of my novels for the stage, which I've never done before. I have, I've adapted other people's work. I have a, a new version of A Christmas Carol that's being produced this Christmas, but I've never tried to adapt my own work for the stage. And it's been, an absolutely fascinating experience. And the, the resulting script, um, we're doing Escaping Dreamland. We have, there's a lot of things in the play that are not in the book. And of course, there's a ton of stuff in the book that's not in the play because you've got to sort of focus down. But it, it's been really interesting to do that with a group of people, um, not just, I didn't just sit in a room by myself. We, we got these actors together, you know, sort of week after week, and we would talk about what scenes would work and, uh, you know, how, how the structure was working. So there's been a lot of interaction, interplay between my work in the theater and my work as a novel novelist. And I think they certainly have both influenced each other. Fascinating, thank you. Um, Scott would like to know, is there a connection between Lewis Carroll and C.S. Lewis? Both were steeped in faith and both wrote for children. So, I mean, both lived in Oxford, both, both uh, had rooms in Oxford colleges, um, Lewis Carroll at Christchurch and uh, C.S. Lewis at, at Maudlin, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they, I'd say the biggest connection is they get mistaken for each other, uh, often by reputable members of the British press. I mean, there was, a, there was a British newspaper article that came out not too long ago that said, that claimed that Lewis Carroll had proofread The Hobbit for J.R.R. Tolkien. Well, Lewis Carroll died in 1898, and I think The Hobbit was published in 1937. So it's quite a remarkable thing for him to have done that. Um, I think it was Brian Sibley who told me that not, even C.S. Lewis didn't do that, much less did Lewis Carroll do it. Um, mm. But so there's no there's no direct connection. But I think the the similarities are are many. I mean, you you have people who whose faith underlies a lot of what they do. You have people who um, are brilliant at telling stories to children. I mean, both the Narnia books and the Alice books began as just spoken stories to specific young children. Um, and then you have people who are sort of influenced by the pastoral nature of the countryside, the very specific countryside around Oxford. Um, I mean, there's no doubt that you can you can walk around Oxford and and feel like you're in Wonderland, whether you're in one of the colleges or you're on the side of the river. And you can also walk in places near Oxford and feel like you're in Narnia. You know, there, there's that pastoral 
uh, quality to to their works. Um, so while while I don't I I don't know of any place where C.S. Lewis talks about a Lewis Carroll influence, although there certainly may be. I'm not I'm no Lewis C.S. Lewis scholar. Um, that there's definitely uh, similarities. Uh, Kate may know more than, than I do uh, as a as an Inkling fan, although I'm I'm an Inkling fan too. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know of any um, direct correlation between them, apart from the fact that um, I know um, Jack Lewis, C.S. Lewis, uh, when he first came to Oxford, he felt very strongly that he was in a place where great writers had been had lived in the past, and he felt you know, because, you know, books were his thing. Um, you know, what I do find um, interesting between them is, is the way that they're able to, um, their books are full of kind of humour and, you know, delights in language, but they also have this kind of serious undertow as well. And I think that's one of the reasons why I'm drawn to both of these writers. So there's another question here from Stephanie. Um, asking, did writing about a modern day Himmler give you nightmares? Well, I don't, didn't give me literal nightmares, but I mean, it's definitely a creepy thing to do. I'm, you know, I'll, I'll back up a little bit here. I, um, many years ago, I was writing a history of a, a local independent school where I had been a student and I was on staff at the time and it was their 75th anniversary. So I was doing a lot of local research and I came across this article in our local newspaper about a psychiatrist uh, who unexpectedly committed suicide. And it turned out he had been the psychiatrist at Nuremberg, the original um, allied psychiatrist who examined all of the, the prisoners at Nuremberg and, uh, and had been criticized for sort of being a little too chummy, particularly with Goring. Um, but when he came back to America, he wrote this book in which he said, look, all the American propaganda has been telling you for the last several years that the Nazis are all crazy. That's why they do this stuff, because they're crazy. And I'm a psychiatrist and I'm here to tell you they're not crazy and that should really concern you. And nobody listened to him. Um, and I just found that a really fascinating story. And so I started working, I've never finished it. I started working on a play about this psychiatrist and Hermann Goering. So I ended up doing a lot of research about Goering in particular. So I'd been down this rabbit hole of researching a, a Nazi leader before. Um, and so I think I was kind of armored because of that previous experience, if you will. Um, and I was sort of going at sort of one very specific thing about Himmler. I, I, I didn't want to get into, because, you know, you can go into some, you know, he, this is the guy who sort of came up with the idea for the Holocaust. This is it's pretty, mm -hmm. pretty horrible things. Um, but I had read that his library of occult books had been discovered in the National Library of, of what was then Czechoslovakia, then now the Czech Republic in Prague. Uh, and it consisted of something like 11,000 volumes. And I thought, I want to know more about that. Um, and so that was kind of the, his his fascination with the occult, um, which he shared with other Nazi leaders, but was was sort of the specific um, little sliver of him that I was uh, investigating in this particular book. And I think by sort of keeping that focus, I was able to do what I needed to do for this book without, you know, just going to a really, really dark place. Thank you. Um, this next question, there's a comment in the chat saying, finish that play, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then this next question comes um, from David asking, is there anything you read during your research for both of these books that you loved, but that didn't make it into them, that you had to leave on the cutting room floor? Um, I mean, certainly with the Lewis Carroll book, absolutely. It was almost 200,000 words at one point. And I think it finished out at about 120. So a lot, a lot of stuff got cut out. What the, my original idea for the Lewis Carroll book was I was gonna write this biography. And then at the end, I was gonna, Lewis Carroll at the end of his life had wanted to write a book about what he called religious difficulties. Um, and it was one of many books that was on his list, his to-do list that he, that he didn't get to. Only ever, he only really ever wrote one chapter in it. Um, and that was the chapter about uh, where he sort of challenged the um, the idea of eternal punishment. Um, so I had this idea. It's like I will recreate Lewis Carroll's book of religious difficulties 
as sort of an appendix to this book. And I'll just take everything where he wrote about something vaguely religious and try to write an essay about it, you know. Well, that just got really unwieldy. And so in the end, what I did is I incorporated a lot of what I learned working on that in, into the biography and didn't, didn't do this other, um, this other piece. So there were certainly things that, that ended up um, on the cutting room floor. And then when you're doing a novel, I mean, all kinds of stuff ends up on the floor. I, one of the things we didn't really touch base on, touch on in, in talking about the Enigma affair is that it features as a minor character, a quite minor character, uh, Peter Byerly, who was the hero of my first novel, The Bookman's Tale. And people have been constantly saying to me, what's going on with Peter? Bring Peter back. And I, you know, I didn't really want to bring him back as a, you know, as a main character. But, I, but again, it grew out of the needs of the text. I needed somebody who understood about rare books and forgery and who lived in North Carolina. And I was like, I already know this guy. It's Peter Byerly. <laughs> um, so, uh, but there was a scene at one point a later in the book with Peter Byerly, where he's being interviewed by a European um, police officer, you know, over the phone. And it was, it just was too much. It, it was too, it was too, hey, everybody, look, aren't I having fun with Peter Byerly? You know, and so my agent and I agreed that, yeah, that we, we go ahead and take that one out. So there are always things like that, where sometimes it's just, you're just having fun writing. And you think it would be fun to write a scene, and it is fun to write a scene, but that scene doesn't necessarily belong in the book. So this next question has come in anonymously for both of you. Um, and it is, as writers, how do you know when to cut yourself off from research? And when does research Ooh. become procrastination? Wow. You want to go first, Kate? <laughs> sure, I'll go first because, you know, my books are extremely research intensive. You know, they're big, um, complex historical novels and the research is enormous. But I love the research. Um, I always say research is simply reading with a purpose. You're reading about something that you're already fascinated with and you're you're reading it on hyper alert because you're looking for what it is that you need. You're looking for the story. Um, and the more research you do, the more fascinated you get. So when do you know when to stop doing research? But I think it's really good to remember that you only need to know what your characters know. You, you don't need to know absolutely everything. Um, and what you want to do is you want to learn it, you want to internalize it so that when you're writing, you are in the skin of your characters. Um, you, you don't feel the need to drop in vast amounts of um, historical information in order to teach your readers something it has to be living on the page it has to be woven in so cleverly and so subtly that the reader is learning without even knowing that they're learning and it's always best to do too little rather than too much yeah to me there's there's sort of two maybe even three types of research but certainly two you know before I think especially for my novel Escaping Dreamland which was said a lot of it was set in New York City in 1906 and so there was a lot probably more research for that because so much of it was set in this historical time period um, so I began by just reading books about the, the time period uh, and reading some books that were written in the time period so we could get a sense of the of the language and of the rhythm of the way people spoke at the time um, but then then once I start working out the story there's this other kind of research which is you know i'm working on a chapter today and i need a character to go from this part of new york to this part of new york and it's 1906 how does she do it does she take a train does she take a horse-drawn vehicle does she take an electric and so you suddenly go down a whole rabbit hole of research on those kinds of things um but my favorite kind of research is kind of it's sort of in between the two it's when i'm looking for character stuff and I, you know, I'll give you a quick example. Escaping Dreamland, one of the real themes of that is the theme of identity and the different ways that um, over time people have been forced to sort of hide their true selves because of the society that they live in. So I wanted one of my characters to go to the circus. She's writing a book about the circus. And so I looked up what, what was a circus like in New York City in 1906. And I found I wanted to find an act that I could describe. And there was a there was an act of um, acrobats. And I thought, great, I like acrobats. Everybody likes acrobats. I can describe them. And I'm reading about them. And they say, you know, there's a, the youngest one is a little girl. They're throwing her up in the air and she's spinning around and they're doing all these great things with her. And then at the end of the newspaper article, it says, oh, by the way, the little girl is not a little girl. 
it's a little boy dressed as a little girl. And I mean, it's so, it was so perfect for my novel. I never would have made that up, but the research just like came up at a, at a such a higher level than, than what I would have made up if I didn't do the research um, and gave me this, this gem, you know, and there were so many examples of that in, in many of my novels where, where I was hoping for something from the research and what I got was something way better than what I was hoping for. Yeah, it's so fascinating, isn't it, research? Um, you often don't know what it is that you need until you find it. Yeah, yeah. And then when and then when you find it, it's it's like it had been there all the time, just waiting for you to discover it. It's yeah. it, it's this incredibly, you know, synchronous moment where where you feel, oh my god, you know, I, it, if I hadn't been writing this book, this would never have been discovered. Yeah. I mean, there's I've had moments where I've almost thought. You just want to go back into the past and say to someone, how did you know I was going to write this novel 100 years later? Because you did exactly the right thing. <laughs> exactly. Know? It, you know, but those are the moments that make writing so worthwhile because yeah. it makes you feel that, you know, you know, what you're doing is meant to be and you're just bringing the pieces together and, and making it happen. It's a really eerie and beautiful moment. Yeah. This next question is also for both of you. It came in from Leslie asking, what are you both working on now? If you can tell us about it. Do you want to go first? Um, um, so I have two novels that are partly written and it may be, they may turn out to be novels or they may not. I'm never, I'm never sure at this stage. Um, I had, I've, I've been in the very unusual situation this month of having three books come out in a two week period because two of them were delayed by, by, various COVID issues. Um, and so I haven't been doing a lot of writing lately because I've been focused on, you know, three almost simultaneous book releases. Um, but I do have this adaptation of A Christmas Carol that we're do that we have auditions for in next week. So if anybody wants to come to Winston-Salem and be in A Christmas Carol, you know, come down. Uh, and then uh, this adaptation of Escaping Dreamland we're going to do next season um, at this with the same theater company. Uh, and and on the Lewis Carroll front, I am writing a new bibliography of the works of Lewis Carroll. The last one was done um, over 40 years ago, and there's been so much that's been discovered since then um, that it's really time to, to sort of completely redo it. Uh, but, but on the novel front, um, yeah, all I can say is one of them, at least, I think is going to be a lot of fun. If it goes the direction I think it's going to be, I'm kind of um using more of humor in this one than I often do uh and so if it if it plays out it, it hopefully it'll it'll be good fun you know? mm -hmm. so um Charlie I've also had three books published this year which oh, is good for you in, I know but it's exactly the same thing where they were not meant to be three books yeah. coming out yeah. in the one year and so this year has been just back to back talking and sure. um you know tr and traveling um and but you know aren't we in such a wonderful privileged position that we can have three books coming out oh yeah year? I mean I'm, I'm not complaining <laughs> I'm not complaining either um so the book that I'm working on now is a real departure for me um you know most of my books are historical fiction and so that's the you know I you know the past is a place I like to play in but this time I'm going so far back into the past that I'm really going back into myth um, so I'm retelling an ancient Greek myth, um, and it's a literal retelling. So in the Crimson Thread, I draw upon the Minotaur and the Labyrinth myth, but it's what I call a metaphorical retelling or a figurative me retelling. So there's, you know, there's no Minotaur in the book, no actual Minotaur. There's only a, a metaphorical one. Yeah. But in the, in the book I'm writing now, I'm retelling the story of Eros and Psyche. And so... You know, I'm pretty sure there might be a flying horse or, or you know, a few gods and goddesses there. So I'm really enjoying the freedom of imagination that going so sure. far back in time is giving me after writing historical fiction where I'm so constrained by, even though I love to be constrained by them, but so con constrained by the known facts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I love about the Crimson Thread is the, is the ancientness of of Crete, of, of the landscape that it's set in and how people are always hiding out in these, you know, 
thousand, two thousand year old caves with all kinds of decor in them and ancient chapels and ancient monasteries. And you get this sense that this horrible thing that's happening, the Nazi invasion, is in in the in the span of history of this place, it's just this tiny little blip, you know, but it's the blip that these characters are are, are stuck in at the moment. But I, I love that that feel of historical context that you get in that book just by describing the landscape, you know. Yeah, Crete is such an amazing place. You know, Greece is, is it, you know, it's a, a country haunted by thousands of years of history. And so it, it's a very rich ground for, um, and of course it meant that I got to go to Greece. My children were very pleased with that. Somebody has to do it, you know. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So we are just about out of time, but we do have one more anonymous question that came in um, asking, you both write for both adults and children. Can you tell us about how your voice differs when you write for a younger audience than when you're writing for adults? Um, I might answer this one first this sure. time, Charlie. So um, to me, a story, I always know what, straight away whether I'm writing for children or writing for adults. Um, I'm never confused about the difference between them. Um, when I'm writing for a child, I'm in a way I'm writing for my own inner child, the, you know, the, the bookworm that I was when I was 11 or 12. To me, it's simply um, writing for children is more simple, more direct, everything's shorter, sentences, chapters, the book itself is much, much shorter. And it's much more vivid. Um, you you don't have any words to waste, and so the every word has to count. It, it has to work really, really fast and really, really vividly on on the page. Um, I also find that um, that that my child uh, children readers still have a great sense of wonder and imagination, and they're really willing to be transported. Um, and and so in a way, when you're writing for adults, you need to you know make sure they're fully engaged, and you need to make them uh, lean into the book and want to be transported. While with children, as long as you have um, you know those opening lines have a really strong hook, then you've got them, and they will tr travel with you wherever you take them. Yeah, I you know I the book that I just had come out for middle grade students is is the first book that I've written for children. I've written lots and lots of plays for children, which is a which is somewhat of a different animal. But I think there is certainly one overarching similarity, and that is that I never wanted to write down to children. No. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't worry about whether when I was writing plays about whether kids were going to get a particular joke. Or I love it when when a 22 year old person comes up to me and says, hey, I just got that joke that you wrote for me to say in my third grade play, you know, 15 years ago. Whatever. That, and that happens, you know, so uh, I'm fine with that um, because I've had I've had the joy of of as I've grown up and learned more about the world, suddenly understanding something from my childhood that I didn't get at the time. Um, so I don't want to write down to them. I, I will say in in the book of the seven spells, which I hope will be the first of a trilogy, and it's a it's a magical adventure about four really really different children who get thrown together um, when they discover this magical library, and they're trying to keep this very powerful book out of the hands of not Heinrich Himmler, but somebody who's you know all similarly unpleasant. Um, I followed some of those same rules of the thriller, but I think it's it's condensed. I mean, instead of being 110,000 words, it's, you know, 65,000 words or something. And so what that meant was those action sequences that we talk about, they came more frequently. And at the end, it's just bam, 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 bam. You know, it's sort of action all the all the time for the last few chapters. But even at the beginning, you know, they, they are coming more frequently than in a book like The Enigma Affair or, or one for adults. And so I think that there is that difference in that it's, 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 it's a similar structure, just kind of condensed down to two thirds the size. Um, but as far as uh, voice and vocabulary and everything else, I I just tell a story as if there were a child sitting there and, and we were telling a story. And I use whatever words I would use. And if a kid stops me and says, hey, I don't know that word, then I'll tell them what the word means. But you know, in this case, we just have a list of difficult words in the back of the book. Um, without definitions. Um, the, the idea being that 
you can look in the back of the book and go, oh, so it's okay that I didn't know what that word meant, but it's on, you know, it's on you to go look it up. You can, it's pretty easy to do that these days, you know? Um, so I don't like to write down to kids, but I, but I do sort of like the idea of, of sort of condensing the form um, and everything kind of just moves a little bit quicker. Absolutely. Thank you. That's really interesting. Um, thank you both so much, Charlie and Kate. This has been a fascinating evening. I've really been enjoying it. I know our audience has as well. Um, Kate, thank you for getting up so early in the morning yes. in Australia. It's my pleasure. With us. And I have to say, I've had my morning exercises every 15 minutes. I can jump up and do star jumps <laughs> to get my lights working again. So, you know, <laughs> it's been a win win for me this morning. So, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you, Charlie. It's been great. I've, I've loved it, Kate. I will look forward to seeing you in May in the Cotswolds. Um, we'll definitely have a meal or a tea or a beer or something. It would be fantastic. And, um, um, you know, maybe you can get me into the kilns. I've always wanted to go to the kilns. I have a friend who went there recently and said it was great. So. <laughs> oh, okay. We've, we've got an, an adventure to look forward to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And audience, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And you can find um, both of these authors' great books at northshire.com, as well as a list of other upcoming events. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank Bye-bye, everyone.